Hello again. Thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy and space science. My name is Andrew Dunkley. Coming up, we are going to look at Starliner yet again. Gee, it's getting a Guernsey in just about every episode uh, of late, but, uh, well, there's been plenty to talk about, let's face it. Uh, also, an another spacecraft, uh, which is the product of SpaceX, looks like it's going to be doing missions to Mars in the not-too-distant future. What's that all about? Well, it's uh, one of those great dreams of a great man, and we'll um, see what he's got in mind. Uh, there's also suggestions that our galaxies are bigger than we thought, much, much bigger. Why? How? What's it all mean? And a passing star might have been causing a little bit uh, of disruption out around that trans-Neptunian area. We'll talk about all of that on this episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And here to discombobulate uh, all of that and to brush off brush turkeys is <laughs> Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Yes, you've uh, you've just touched on the on the nerve that's affecting us all at the moment in brush turkey egg laying season. <laughs> Want to yeah, be everywhere. <laughs> so, so you've got you've got them um, scr scratching around your backyard, literally. Yeah, literally, yes. They they dig up everything to try and build a nest, and it's uh, you know they're a protected species. They're probably endangered, actually. Uh, so we we're very fond of brush turkeys, but what they do to your garden is pretty serious stuff. So we just try and I've, I've actually tried contacting their solicitor and things of that sort just yeah. to see whether that has any effect. But uh, we'll see. Yes, uh, they're, they're damn ugly, though, Fred. I mean, yeah. I know they're endang endangered and they're protected, and then Australian natives, but they they look like a cross between a traditional turkey and a vulture. Yes, yeah, that's a that's actually a really good description. They do, um, and you know, they've got the the brain of an ant as well. So they're they're not <laughs> sort of you know they're not gifted in. I mean, when you compare them with. Uh, some of the other species that we have around here, particularly the sulphur-crested cockatoos, which have got the intelligence of a, of a, a primate, the intelligence of a primate. Yeah, they're primate. very they bright. Extraordinary creatures. Mm. Um, we've sent a note to them as well about leaving their droppings on our outdoor furniture, but that's uh, still a, a matter for uh, the legal fraternity. Well, I'm, I'd be surprised if they haven't destroyed your furniture. No, they, they like chewing things. They do like chewing things, yeah, but they've, they've been okay so far. I think they, yeah, yeah. So far, so far. I, I love I love sulphur crested cockatoos. Yeah. We've got squillions of them out at the golf course, but mm. uh, they they're not loved when you're just in the middle of your downswing and one of them goes. Oh yeah, they, they, do they <laughs> you go. What was that? If you're standing next yeah, to okay. one, they'll, they'll nearly. Drive your eardrums out there. Oh, yeah, they're loud. They are super loud. Mm. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what, what wildlife issues about? aside, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, let's uh, let's talk about Starliner for a change. Uh, some good oh, news yes. at last. Yeah. Um, so Starliner, uh, the t you know the the spacecraft that we've been talking about solidly for the last what two and a half months, three months actually. Yes. Uh, has made a textbook return to Earth uh, at the end of last week. Uh, disconnected from the International Space Station. All 27 of its thrusters worked perfectly uh, because that was the big ticket item, whether the thrusters were reliable or not. Uh, and, yep, yeah, backed away from the spacecraft, uh, fired its rockets to re-enter and touch down completely safely, uh, exactly on target, in a huge vindication, uh, as some of the media are reporting, a huge vindication for Boeing's engineers. Um and I think there's been a lot of back, 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 back patting all around, uh, which is great, um, uh, including the two astronauts left behind on the space station, yes. Williams and I feel I feel Williams. terrible for them. They, they 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 were full of congratulations to the to the Boeing engineers who they've worked with very closely, obviously for a long period of time, not just uh, while they've been in space. Um, yeah. and, you know they 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 reconcile themselves to another. Uh, however many months it is in space, quite some time ago. And so 
uh, they had already made peace with the, the whole issue. Uh, and, they, and, yeah, they're full of congratulations, as are NASA too. Uh, you know, the, we had reports of a bit of friction between Boeing and NASA uh, about this, um, and certainly there was some robust discussion, we believe, in meetings, but nothing like what might be blown out by the tabloid, tabloid media. Um, and yes. so, yeah, I think, I think there's congratulations all around. Yes, it is good news, and uh, of course the two Starliner astronauts are still on the ISS and will be there probably till early next year. And by the time this podcast is released, uh, Starliner would have been on the ground for probably nearly a couple of weeks. But it's worth mentioning that they brought it back safely. All is well. Uh, it just didn't have any passengers. It was just uh, auto autopiloted back to Earth, which is extraordinary in itself, the way they do that these days with all these different spacecraft. They they um, they don't need humans to make them go up and down, but they do need humans to push the magic buttons that you know, are just there for decoration, I think. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, though, um, it's good to have it back. Um, there must be a, a collective sigh of relief. Okay. Yes, let's move on to another spacecraft, and this one is the um, brainchild of SpaceX, uh, the Starship Mega Rocket, which they say in the next couple of years will be sending missions to Mars, uh, initially un unpersoned, but ultimately leading to um, uh, people going to Mars. Uh, this is this is actually a um, a plan that might. Um, you know, we talked about before and people are saying, oh, it's a pipe dream, it'll never happen. But they're certainly looking seriously at Elon Musk's uh, plan of um, putting a city on Mars. He's still going there. Yes, so that's right. That's the whole motivation for developing Starship, Andrew. And um, it's <clears throat> quite remarkable. It is remarkable hardware. So it's two, um, two parts to it. The first stage booster, which is called the Super Heavy, and then the upper stage, which itself is 50 metres tall, and that's the, the second stage, uh, known as Starship. And, and unlike most uh, spacecraft, and certainly the Falcon 9 series that um, Elon has developed, which has a, um, a first stage and then a separate second stage and then the payload itself, uh, with Starship, the payload is built into the second stage. And so it is um, really quite... Uh, and a different sort of architecture for the spacecraft from others. So what we have uh, is a, a tweet from, I beg your pardon, uh, a, a SpaceX, sorry, a, 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 an X, uh, a, whatever it's called, message, uh, formerly known as a tweet from Elon Musk on, uh, on Saturday, um, uh, the last week as we are speaking. Um, a post, that's the word I want, a post, a post, post on it. Yeah, and so what he's saying is what his target timelines are for uh, for the first space uh, star, starship missions to Mars, and it is two years. Uh, that mm -hmm. is exactly as you've said, uh, uncrewed missions to start with, with trials to land on Mars, um, and he's talking about that happening uh, in two years. Um, and then two years later, and you, you know he's he's partly um, limited by the physics of getting to Mars, which you can only do every twenty six months. That's when the two or the orbits of the two um, planets bring them into the right kind of alignment. So that when you when you get to the other end of the of the trip, uh, Mars is where you want it to be, rather than somewhere else in its orbit. So that happens every twenty six months. So two years time. Uh, an uncrewed mission to Mars, or perhaps several, and then uh, in four years' time, he's talking about sending people to Mars. Uh, and his quote is, flight rate will grow exponentially from there with the goal of building a self-sustaining city in about 20 years. Being multiplanetary will vastly increase the probable lifespan of consciousness as we will no longer have all our eggs literally and metaphorically, actually says metabolically, uh, on one planet. So got them both. Uh, look, it's, um, it's Elon Musk at his finest in terms of uh, big vision stuff. Um, I think the rest of the world is looking on and saying, 
in your dreams because there's so many unknowns about getting humans to Mars. It's something mm. that we are simply faced with, um, you know, real, real difficulties that um, brute force and ignorance is just not going to cut it. Uh, so I think we'll see uh, slippage perhaps from that. But uh, what's interesting to us as space watchers, of course, is seeing that technology evolve. Uh, just a, a, a final footnote about this, Andrew. Um, the Starship has had four flights so far, and the last one basically achieved all that was hoped to achieve. And the fifth one is being planned. And I think the fifth one is uh, the crucial one because they will uh, return the spacecraft, the, uh, the Starship, uh, back to Earth on a, on a soft landing rather than just losing it into the ocean, which is what's happened before. Yeah. Look, um, people might be laughing behind his back and saying this is just a pipe dream, but if you don't have people that dream big, you probably don't achieve things at um, at the high end of the spectrum. I'm sure, because you don't hear about it in the history books, but I'm sure people laughed at the Wright brothers and everyone else oh, yeah. who was attempting to fly yeah. back yes. in those days. Yeah, that's right. They probably thought it was a huge joke. You'll never do it. It's, it's impossible. Yeah. Well... Now look at us. Yeah, and you know, um, I mean, 10 years ago, well, maybe, yeah, 10 years ago, it was thought to be impossible to, to reuse a, a booster, uh, your first stage yeah. rocket, and that is now totally routine. Uh, it was 2015, I think, the first successful booster landing. Uh, and you've only got to look at the track record with Tesla vehicles as well. Um, these yes. This dreaming big can achieve great things. Yeah, not notwithstanding the one Tesla vehicle that's fl floating out there in space somewhere. Yeah, the one that was on its way to Mars but actually overshot and is now in the asteroid belt, I think. So that's it's a, it's a salutary lesson there. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it's probably looking for a parking space station. <laughs> boom, boom. One with a charger on it. One with a charger. Yes, that could be, uh, that could be an issue. Um, but look, I... I I, I think uh, Elon Musk is a remarkable man. I know he gets ridiculed and gets he cops a lot of flack, but he has done some incredible things uh, in the space science world that um, probably wouldn't have been in attempted this soon by many other people. I know that he's not the only one, but uh, he's getting all the headlines and he certainly knows how to um, to get the story out there and get get the interest of the public. Uh, I, I don't doubt that it, he will ultimately achieve this. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Maybe, maybe, maybe not this quickly, but you know, how quickly has he um, perfected these rockets? Mm. But so, what, 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 Andrew, what if, what if he did? Uh, what if in four years' time we're talking about people walking on Mars? Uh, yes. With a... With a, a sp um, with a, a you know a, a starship parked in the background, it's uh, yes. it's it's not impossible. No, it would be impossible. But it's not it would impossible. be it would probably be the achievement of the century because it would be twenty years ahead of when yes. uh, NASA plans to be there, at least ten years ahead, yeah. and it would be a private venture. <laughs> that would I be mean, even more yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, I I wish him well, and uh, I hope I I hope we get to see it. I think it would be fantastic, and yes, um, I, I I wish him nothing but success. I'm sure most people do, uh, and you've got to also think about the brave people that will be doing this because it's not like you know crossing the Atlantic for the first time or uh, crossing Bass Strait for the first time or any of those kinds of ventures that we heard about. A hundred years ago, but um, it's 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 a giant leap, a much giant, yeah, a gianter leap than the moon, and that was a huge jump. So yeah, it's all very, it's all very exciting. Um, and Maybe it, I can no, go, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry, yeah, it will also reinvigorate interest in space science. So yeah. it'll breed a whole new generation of scientists, and and then it will just keep going. I I think. The, I mean, the point where I think um, many space watchers and astronomers and 
uh, philosophers, perhaps I can put it, ethic ethicists, where they diverge from Elon is uh, his sentence, the flight rate will grow exponentially from there with the goal of building a self-sustaining city in about 20 years. Mm. Uh, that, I think, transgresses um, what we, the way we ought to think about the way we treat Mars. Um, and it's, it's part of Elon's philosophy of uh, believing the Earth is doomed and that we need to you know, have a, have a lifeboat. Mars is not our lifeboat. And um, what we have to do is fix our planet, you know. Uh, and, it, and if you want to have a lifeboat, build it. You build a mega structure rather than going and trashing another planet. That's my yeah. end uh, on all this. <laughs> no, I, I know you've um, got issue with um, with occupying other worlds, uh, yeah. but you know the time will come where. Um, more powerful people will probably end up making those kinds of the decisions. Yeah, it sounds that's... like. Yeah, Elon's made his decision. Oh, he has. Uh, has. And, that's right. And mining on the moon. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, that's probably going to happen too. Yeah. And and that's, I think, a different issue. I think you can argue for that from an ethical point of view. I'm not sure about colonizing mm. Mars, though. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I'm, right. look, I have no problem with humans going to Mars. Um, but but I, the model I think we should adopt is a bit like Antarctica, where it's uh, scientific and research purposes mainly rather than but, yeah but nobody nobody can wholly own it or occupy yeah, it yeah yeah that's no fair point okay uh yes very interesting story and if you want to read up on that it's on the space.com website this is space nuts with andrew dunkley and professor fred watson Roger, you're loud and clear here also. space nuts now fred we have talked quite a few times and received a lot of questions about the impending merger of the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies. But now there's a story that suggests uh, they are already touching oh, each yeah. other <laughs> due, to this, um, due to this, uh, this discovery that the galaxies are bigger than we thought. How so? Uh, so, um, and this is a great story because it's got a very strong Australian connection. Scientists from Swinburne University down there in Melbourne. Um, and they, uh, it's uh, interesting from a number of points of view. One is that uh, Swinburne University has a deal with the Keck uh, Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, the two Keck telescopes, they're both 10 meter telescopes, are on Mauna Kea, uh, the tallest mountain it's not really a mountain it's a shield volcano uh, but it's still one of the highest points on planet earth uh, on mm. the big island of hawaii mauna kea so um the keck telescope uh is uh, a 10 meter telescope that has very very fine sensitivity it can penetrate deep into the into space not just looking at very distant objects but looking at fainter things in the you know in the near field things that are around our own galaxy so other galaxies um, in the what you might call the middle distance so what this team has done is they've used this sort of invested time on the one of the Keck, the two Keck telescopes um, and looked at the the gas that surrounds galaxies. And in particular, um, a galaxy which rejoices in the name of IRAS 08339 plus uh, That's <laughs> one of the galaxies that they've looked at. And what they've done is uh, checked for glowing gas around the galaxy. So, um, you know, we, we, when we look at galaxies, look at pictures of galaxies, which many of us do all the time, uh, what we're looking at mostly is the stars and um often glowing gas as well. The pink blobs in the spiral arms of galaxies are pink clouds of glowing hydrogen. Uh, the old joke is that hydrogen is just like people. When it gets excited, it glows pink, uh, but the mechanism's different. Uh, so they've instead looked at glowing oxygen and looked at it at very, very great distances from the centers of these galaxies. And uh, basically, they find it goes much, much further uh, than uh, than 
anybody had expected. Uh, and this is a real achievement because this gas is 10,000 to 100,000 times fainter than the brighter parts of a galaxy. So, mm. um, you know, that's just penetrating really deep into the, the, the fainter regions of the universe. And so, uh, yeah, so what, what they've discovered is that, um, that perhaps each, each uh, galaxy has this shroud of gas that extends maybe 100,000 light years into space. Now, 100,000 light years is what we usually think of as the diameter of the disk of our galaxy. So, you know, if you, if you um, basically double that uh, in, in size, uh, you've got the new version of what galaxies are like, how big they are, and they are colossal. And, and is it true that because of this, they believe that Andromeda and our gal galaxy are already touching, technically speaking? Yeah, the, 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 uh, yes, that's right. I mean, um, this Andromeda galaxy is about two and a half million light years away from ours. Um, if you've got uh, 100,000 light years uh, of, of gas, worth of gas in each of those galaxies, they're not actually touching, but they may well be interacting uh, the you know at the extremities because gravity operates over great distances so they may be already tugging at one another if I can put it that way uh, with these halos of gas so yeah I think it's fair a fair point to say that collision with Andromeda has already started hold on to your hats everybody wow <laughs> gosh and we were sitting here you know we were going to wait that couple of billion years yeah we yeah, we thought we were in the diary but yeah. don't have to now it's happening. Yeah. Now, I, I know these gas surrounds have been previously discovered. We're talking, you know, 70 odd years ago that they were discovered, but it's only because of a new piece of equipment they've been able to really analyze them today. Is that accurate? It's, it's yes, it's one of the, uh, uh, the, you know, the Keck telescopes are equipped with very, very fine auxiliary instrumentation. And uh, one of them, uh, is the instrument that's been used uh, to do this? Uh, it's um, it, it's it's basically um, it's it's got what's called an image slicer on it, and that does exactly what the name implies. It takes an image, slices it up, but then for each slice, you can get a separate spectrum. Uh, <clears throat> we in Australia have um, similar technologies on well, certainly the Anglo Australian Telescope, but we don't use we don't slice the images; we break them up into pixels by using fiber optics. So it's a different technique, but it has the same, basically the same outcome. Uh, but the thing about the image slicer is you can make them incredibly sensitive, and that's why they've been able to get the spectrum of oxygen out to these great distances from from the from the galaxy uh, at those incredibly faint levels so yes it's all about the technology that is now available on these marvelous telescopes incredible so beyond the extremities of the spiral arms uh, of our galaxy and well other galaxies even without those sorts of um, structures there's a gas halo that stretches out that far again is that basically what that, that's, that's correct yeah and and um, perhaps the most uh, startling outcome of the research that uh, these uh, scientists have have done on this is that those gas halos when you add them up for all galaxies they probably make up uh, they believe between 70 and 90% of the normal matter in the universe um you know now the normal matter is the stuff that's not dark matter or dark energy, uh, and we, you know, we we know that um, uh, uh, we think of normal matter as being about five percent of the mass energy budget of the universe, and we usually think mm. of that as being in stars. Uh, stars are the glowing stuff, the stuff you can see. But actually, what they're saying is that much more of it is in these galaxy halos. 70 to 90. So, so does that does that change the ratio? Does that change the formula of what? No, it, the no, it, no, it doesn't. Um, what, what it changes is the ratio within that 5%, which is normal matter. So right. um, what we're saying is that rather than, you know, half of it being stars and half of it being gas, most of it is gas. Uh, and, um, and that's a, 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 a new aspect of this whole study. Mm, okay. Wow. That's intriguing. And they, and they think this applies to just about... Every galaxy yes, in the universe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> Quite a discovery. Yeah. It is. Um, and um, yeah, you know, all credit to uh, uh, the team. Um, uh, and uh, just to give a give a shout out to the instrument as well, the image slicer that we mentioned, it's called the Cos- Keck Cosmic Web Imager. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's uh, pretty dramatic stuff. And it proves my theory, Fred, that the universe is built on baked beans. Well, that's naturally what um, what we it's not what your mind goes to, really, isn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> There's that much gas. Yeah. Yes, um, fascinating story, and you can read uh, more about that on the Conversation website. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Zero G, and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Let's uh, get into our final chat, uh, Fred. Uh, this one is about uh, disruption uh, in the extremities of our solar system due to a passing star. So what happened and when? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a long time ago. Um, I figured it might be. <laughs> <laughs> before you and I were born. Um, <laughs> uh, it's So um, it's a good question, actually. Um, I'm not sure that they can pin down when this happened. Uh, but uh, I should have another look at the paper because I've got the. It's a paper in uh, Nature magazine, uh, which um, goes into details of this very nicely. Uh, and what what the uh, what they are doing, the scientists involved with this work, who are principally in Europe, if I remember, um, at uh, the University of Leiden, comes into my mind. Yes. Uh, the Leiden University uh, is where this research has been done. Uh, so uh, what have they done? They've looked at the trans-Neptunian objects, which we've talked about a lot because yep. they are implicated in the idea of Planet Nine, and I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, there, this group uh, from Leiden University have done a huge number of computer simulations to see why these trans-Neptunian objects um, have such highly inclined orbits. Uh, when you think about the, you know, the the orbital plane of the solar system, the one that the planets lie in, there that's pretty flat. I think Mercury is the one that sticks out most. Um, but the trans-Neptunian objects are not like that. And I should mention that the main belt asteroids mostly sit within the in the plane of the planets as well. And that all comes about, of course, because of the way planets are formed from a rotating disk of material, the protoplanetary disk. But uh, when you look really a long way out uh, to the trans-Neptunian objects, objects further away than Neptune, they're tipped over at all kinds of angles. Uh, in fact, some are vertical almost, and there's one or two that are so far angled that they're going the wrong way around. They're actually going in the, in the wrong direction. Um, And so the scientists at Leiden have questioned what it is that has caused this. And their simulations basically tell them that a star of about 0.8 solar masses, so 80% of the mass of our sun, flew past at quite a close distance, uh, a distance of 110 astronomical units. Now, we know that an astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, 150 million kilometers. So it's 110 times that is about 16.5 billion kilometers, uh, about nearly four times uh, the distance between the Sun and Neptune. So that passage of a star, uh, and they suggest billions of years ago, without pinning down exactly when it was, uh, what they find is that that tipped up uh, many of these orbits and disturbed them uh, so that we've got all these inclined orbits. But they also believe um, that this explains some of the peculiar uh, uh, orbits of moons of the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Some of those oh. moons go the wrong way around. Uh, and right. they've always been, it's always been suggested that they've been they captured asteroids, basically captured trans-Neptunian objects that strayed into the inner solar system and got captured by these planets. And so um, what the Leiden scientists are saying is that uh, it's 
maybe uh, the same event when the star flew by the solar system not only disturbed all these outer asteroids to put their orbits at high inclined angles, but also flung some of them into the inner solar system where they were captured as moons. So it's a very, very neat story. Um, it makes it, sense, though, when you think about it. Absolutely. It makes perfect sense. It's uh, exactly yeah. the kind of gravitational disturbance that you think might do that. So, uh, bless you. Uh, yes, that's Judy going off out there. <laughs> that, that's with the good old hay fever, I guess, still. Yeah. Um, now, you, I mentioned Planet Nine a minute ago, that great theory that I think was, we've been had that around since 2016 or thereabouts, if I remember rightly. And that's saying that, yes, we've got uh, very uh, elongated orbits uh, out in that um, outer solar system region, uh, but that some of them align in a way that's suspicious that there's another planet out there. So the mm. paper that we're talking about now, um, which in Nature Astronomy is called The Trajectory of the Stellar Flyby That Shaped the Outer Solar System. It's a very nice title. Um, that paper is uh, uh, very briefly uh, includes a mention of Planet Nine. And I'm going to read the paragraph that it's in. It says... Eventually, high-inclination trans-Neptunian objects could be crucial when deciding between different hypotheses. Retrograde trans-Neptunian objects themselves, and that's ones that go backwards in their orbits, provide a challenge for the planet instability model. Adding a distant planet, in brackets Planet 9, appeared to solve the problem. This combined model can at account for retrograde trans-Neptunian objects, um, and with certain parameters. Uh, uh, but it says, however, distant, highly inclined trans-Neptunian objects, if they exist, may provide a challenge also for the Planet Nine model. So what they're saying is Planet Nine actually helps in their theory. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe it's a combination of both, this passing star and a planet that we have not yet discovered in the depths in the solar system. So to to put it in super scientific technical speak we had a solar system sized bull in a china shop uh yes i think that sums it up uh, very uh boven bovinely if i can use that bovinely yes. well the cow jumped over the moon the bull yeah that's absolutely the bull. in the china shop yeah the bull did the rest yeah. Oh, it's a great it's a great story, and if it holds true, which it certainly, you know, the mathematics works. Um, yeah, it could answer a lot of questions, uh, and and add a bit more, a touch more weight to the potential for a planet Maybe. nine, which I like. I I want it to be there. I do. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. Um, if you'd like to follow up on that story, it's a, it's a good read, but it's super technical. So my brain went snap. Uh, Nature.com has that story. <laughs> Um, that brings us to the end, friend. Uh, thank you so much for your presence yet again. It's always enlightening. <laughs> Better than end darkening, isn't it? Which is uh, what we'll talk <laughs> Depending about. Depending on where you are. Yeah. Yes. No, great stuff, Andrew. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and thanks to Hugh in the studio. Uh, we got a question about Hugh the other day. I'll try and tackle that in a future episode. Hmm. Uh, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. Catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.